right, well, good evening, and I uh, hope you're having a good Wednesday, middle of the week. It's been a wild week, but I think we'll make it through. Um, so real quick, I want to go over some of our prayer requests and give you an update. So uh, on Brother John, good thing he is doing better, which is definitely a blessing. He is home, and so everyone loves to be home, better than the hospital, so we're thankful for that. Uh, he'll be in quarantine through next week, and he is on the men hold him up in prayer for physical healing and um, uh, that he will just be ready to come back uh, with a vengeance. I'm sure he will be. Um, also, uh, just remember to be praying for our community. Uh, there are several uh, nursing home patients. There is 18 positive cases, and one of them is David Thomas's mother. Um, and then also, please remember uh, Erica Hall. Uh, it's uh, Erica Canant now, I believe. Uh, she had a horse accident, and so she had surgery on Tuesday, and she needs lots of prayer for recovery, so please keep her in mind, as well as please be praying for our country, and please uh, be praying for uh, these patients that are struggling with the COVID, uh, among other things. There's lots of other things that are plaguing people besides just that, uh, but pray for them. Pray for our doctors and uh, health care workers who are uh, working through uh, a long and stressful period, um, and so uh, with that, I want to move to our lesson this evening, so we're going to be in the book of Galatians, and it um, shouldn't take very long, but I do want to share a few thoughts with you this evening, so as you turn there, we will be uh, reading in chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 15, but understand that the Apostle Paul is writing this book. He had went on a preaching mission, and he goes to an area named Galatia. And so the people that live there are called Galatians, which is why the book has the title that it does. Um, Paul had preached. He had taught. He left them uh, well, in good spirits. Everything was good to go, hunky-dory, fine. And some time passes, and Paul begins to hear um, not good reports. What he's hearing is that they have left his teaching that he instilled to them. Um, they have walked into something that they feel is a more true teaching, a, uh, a better way to God. And essentially what they were doing uh, is becoming Jews. They were trying to change how they ate. They were trying to change the days in which they worshiped, the clothes that they wore, um, becoming more and more oppressed and restricted, um, going right back into all of the difficulties that you know, were there with being a, a New Testament era uh, Jew. And so it was a very distinct lifestyle. You could pick them out of a crowd, um, and they would want to be picked out of a crowd. They would want to be away from the crowd. Um, that was uh, how they you know, felt like they were for gaining righteousness in God's eyes. And so you'll, you'll kind of hear it as you read through the letter, but Paul is literally heartbroken for these people, and he writes to the Galatians in a little bit different tone than almost any of the other epistles. Um, and it's sometimes you'll read commentaries and you read study Bible introductions, and they almost make it seem as if Paul is getting on to them, like he's very angry. Well, he is angry. He is angry, but it's a anger of love. It is a anger as a parent loves a child who knows better, who is taught better, who is choosing a path that is not the best path there is for them. And so with that, what I see are just tear-soaked pages from Paul. It is a, it is a, a plea and a bargain trying to shake them back into reality, trying to shake them back into what they need to have uh, anchoring their entire life. And so we'll go ahead and read, and then I want to share just a few thoughts with you from it. So chapter 2 in verse 15, we'll read to the end of the chapter. Paul said, um, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. 
because by works of the law no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Well, certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose." Um, so I don't anticipate to even scratch what all is here, um, but there is something that just seemed to strike me as I read over that this week that I wanted to share with you. And um, I, I hope that that makes some sense with a little bit of the introduction that we've got um, for what he's driving at. He's driving at that, hey, guys, you're not... Jews by birth. You were born Gentiles. So sometimes whenever I talk to people, the Jew-Gentile thing is really easy to kind of get mixed up on and we get confused like, which one am I? Well, I'm almost guaranteeing you if you were born in Salem, Arkansas, you're likely a Gentile. Um, If you don't know that you're a Jew, then you're not a Jew. You're a Gentile. The Gentiles were the pagans. They they were the ones that did not have the way different God system where we worship on Saturdays with a temple and priests and all that. The the Jews did that. The pagans or Gentiles was just everyone else. And so as we read this, I myself at least am a Gentile in this context. But either way, he's saying we, Paul, Paul, we, we were Jews. We were born that way. We were born into the good path. And even we know that there's no righteousness there. There's no being justified in the eyes of God by, by following all of these rules, by living this life that from the outside just looks like disciplined, hardcore. That's not enough. Um, and, and so take note of that. These are Gentiles who have heard the gospel from Paul. They have now, as Paul left, and these other teachers come in, these other teachers are basically just trying to convert people away from Christ and just get converts for their own way of life, which is just being Jewish. And, and, and man, you know, there's actually an appeal there, which, which sounds crazy, but there is, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. But Paul is just trying to get them to wake up and see that that's not a path that leads anywhere uh, to heaven in in the peace of God. Uh, No one's going to be justified, he says in 16. And uh, he deals with right before this passage is a famous passage where he talks about, okay, well, even Peter, Peter was Jewish. Even Peter showed up where Paul was at, and he was just, doing the life without all of the rules. And there were some Jewish people that came up from Jerusalem. And all at once, Peter gets nervous. Peter wants to look good. And he goes back to his old old way and staying separate and eating different. And Paul says, no, no, dude, no. You, you can't do that. You can't live like a regular Gentile person all the time. And then these people show up and you live like something else entirely. We couldn't do it. Our fathers couldn't do it in the Old Testament. So why are you trying to make them do it? And so on the heels of that story is this statement that we know no one's getting justified. No one's righteous before God just because they live a really disciplined life. And then he always, Paul is always anticipating the the, the comeback. He's expecting what the extreme is from where he's at. So you've got people over here saying, you've got to obey the law. And he's saying, we know you can't be justified by just obeying the law. 
And he's already ready because he's saying, okay, well, the next thing is you're going to go way over here and you're going to say, well, you, so you're just saying you do whatever you want, that, that Christ just died so that you can set a bunch of sinners free to live terribly? And, he, and, and no, he's saying, is Christ a servant of sin? He's saying, did, did Christ come and do his work just so he could set sin to be free and rampant in our lives? And no, that's not correct either. Um, but where it really gets to, I think, the nitty-gritty of it is when he, he gets to this famous verse in verse 20 um, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. He's saying this righteousness justification thing, he's already told us uh, in 16, through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be justified and Christ has died, and he's saying Christ died, literally, the heart stopped. The brain waves stopped. His body stopped living. And, and Paul is saying that I did too. Christ died because of a sin debt. Christ had to die so that sin could be condemned and punished in a human body. And Paul is saying, because he did that, my sinful life has already suffered that punishment. Even though I wasn't there hanging, because I claim to follow Christ and I put my faith in Him, I died when Christ died. So now, my bad death is already done. Now I get to just live. I get to live to God. But the most striking thing out of this passage, especially because of who he's talking to, is verse 21. And, and right before that, he, he says, The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. That is striking because he says, in another, another way, I don't count the grace of God as a worthless thing, as a optional equipment type of apparatus. He does not set the grace of God over here as an unnecessary piece of junk. He tells them that because they are, they are they're, they're saying that's not enough. Yeah, you told us about Christ. You told us about the miracles. You told us about His teaching. We, we get He was different, and we get that His death was important, and we understand there's, there's this witness and this testimony that He actually lives again. But, th but that's not enough. That can't be enough. And I want you to, to think about an important verse in chapter 1, and it's 1 verse 10, because He, he says there's... There's not another gospel. Like, I preached the gospel to you, and now you're turning to some other one. Well, I'm telling you, just like I told you the very first time, if anyone shows up and says, this is the gospel, and it's different, it's false, and you curse them. Because 10, he gets to the point like, I'm not trying to make anyone happy. I'm serving God. And he says, "For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. If you have walked with Christ for very long, that makes complete sense to you. If I was trying to make mankind happy, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. If I was trying to make myself happy, I wouldn't do that. If I was trying to make my family happier, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. And I sure wouldn't do that for my job. Mankind wants something different than what the gospel wants for our lives. So when he says, I don't count it as nothing that the grace of God was there, it's because it's just not enough for us. We want more as people. These people wanted more. They wanted a way so they felt like they earned their way in. They wanted a way that would make them feel like, I'm enough now. 
I have changed. Man, I haven't ate a piece of bacon in eight months. I haven't been on that side of town. I haven't talked to those type of people. Um, I, I'm not trying to, to tell you not to pay attention to the way that you live because certainly that's the other side of this coin. But we see this go wrong all the time in religion. We see this go wrong all the time in Christianity. Bad theology stems from this feeling where we go with our feelings, which is, I need more than just the gospel. I need a way in which my life will make me feel like I've done enough today, like I've crossed it, like I deserve to lay my head down knowing that God loves me because I'd be proud of the life that I live today. That's not it. He, he, could, he could give us this nice, pretty, fancy gospel with 12 steps in it that made you feel like you had really completed something, but he's saying, I'm not doing that. I'm not here to make people happy. I'm telling you what the gospel of Jesus Christ is about. And what happens is we nullify God's grace, and you can do it in a bunch of different ways. These people in Galatia were counting it worthless because they were saying, it's still not enough. We need more. We need a deeper system. I need a way that I can feel more fulfilled because it's not enough for me to know that I admit my sinfulness and I rest that Christ saved me. He died so I don't die in eternal hell and damnation. That's not enough. They want to know like, I did what my church told me to do, and I feel great about it. That serves mankind. The other side of this is where we, in the secular world, are going, which is they also count the grace of God as worthlessness because they don't need it. The world is pushing for us to be so independent and so proud of our humanity and all of its glorious faults, that we don't need God to say, we've, we've got a way. We're like, of course I've got a way. I'm a human being. I was born. I have parents, and I'm a good person. And I have some vices, but in just 10 more years, they won't even be considered vices anymore. They'll just be something to be like, hey, buddy, man, that's awesome. You're doing that. That's crazy. Uh, good for you. Go out there. Live your best life now. The world counts it as worthlessness because they say, God, you should be wanting something from me, not the other way around. I definitely know I'm getting into heaven um, because you're just exclusive and you are just crazy. There's no reason that I shouldn't go into heaven. And so here is this balance, this paddle ball back and forth. And either way, you go either direction with it and you're not serving the Lord You're trying to be a friend and a servant of mankind, either someone else or you're trying to serve your own humanity, which just longs to be told, you're just enough. You've done a great job. Pat on the back, two thumbs up. That's what we want. And instead, what we need to hear is, man, it's got to be enough that Christ died. It has got to be enough that you know that verse which says, because He loved me and knew that even my best efforts, all I'm going to do is do the things that I can do well, and I'm going to focus on those, but I'm not going to pay attention to the other parts about loving people. I can live really super strict and obedient and look great, but I actually think I'm wonderful and I despise the people that aren't like me. Well, you just missed it. And the other side, he loves you and he knows that you want to deviate into this path of saying nothing I do is ever a mistake and I don't need to worry about any righteousness or trying to change my behavior. He knows that you want to go down that path as well. And he still, because he loved you, he died, he gave himself for you so that you can live. And so all I'm telling you is if you do what Satan wants you to do, which is focus on anything but Christ Jesus hanging on the cross, then he wins. That's his goal. 
and He can do it either direction as long as you're not completely astounded and just blown away every day you wake up at the love of Christ and the grace of God, then He's done what He wanted to. He set your mind on something that's not the most important thing. When you focus and you believe that your eternal salvation hangs in the balance of how many good deeds and how good of a life you're living, if you polled your immediate audience, then you've missed the gospel. And if you are so convinced that your, your hard heart and your terrible attitude and your paganism type behavior doesn't matter and you're just saying, well, I, I've been baptized and it don't matter after that, then you've got problems. I am, I am asking you to adopt this attitude of Paul, which is we're not living to be pleasing mankind. We're not trying to please ourselves. We're a servant of Christ, and we should be because He loves us. He loves me. And so as we read that one last time, just because it, it sounds so good, I, I love that he says that. He says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And he gave himself for me. And that's enough for me. And I hope that's enough for you. And right now we have, we have strange and stressful and difficult times. I understand that. Those aren't going away. But you can have peace through that or you cannot have peace. And the quickest way to have peace is to not set the grace of God aside we absolutely need it, and we absolutely have it if we have done what he said, which is we trusted that Christ was God's Son, that he died, that he rose again. He is sitting in heaven waiting for that second when he says, I'm done and I'm coming back. And I am just thrilled with that. It just shook me. I don't want to be over to the side saying, I, I count the grace of God as not enough for me. I don't want to count it as nothing. And so please, I don't want you to do that as well. Um, so I want to pray over you and I'll be done. Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity to read your word and to look at myself through it. And I thank you for a chance to tell others about it. And I pray that you just set it in their hearts and their minds and you haunt them with it throughout the week. Your words coming back to them over and over again so that those who know you are comforted and they are sustained in the grace and the love of Christ. And those that don't know you, they are tormented by their sinfulness. They are tormented by not knowing you by not having peace, by not submitting to you. And I pray that through that you draw them because you love them. Give us the strength to do the things that you lay before us and let us seek obedience. Let us not worry about knowing every nook and cranny and every turn and twist of your plan. Let us aim for obedience because we are blown away with your grace and your mercy and your love. And I thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen.